you very much. That's very, very enlightening and uh, helpful. So for the final presentation in uh, this uh, session, it's uh, Lubdomir uh, Zagarchev from uh, Philips, uh, and he will present uh, imaging biomarkers for early diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, imaging biomarkers and, uh, for TBI, and while I realize that this is a workshop on DTI, I'm going to present some of uh, our effort uh, towards uh, traumatic, uh, addressing the, the needs of traumatic brain injury in general. And uh, uh, before I uh, continue with the slides, I should mention that I'm a part of the clinical science research program and uh, of Philips Research in New York. We have a research lab outside of New York City. And uh, I started the project uh, a few years ago and at different points in time, Karsten, Thomas and Fabian joined the team and they actually work here in our back office lab in Hamburg. So this is uh, truly an international transatlantic effort uh, on traumatic brain injury. Uh, as we all know, uh, basically the, the main challenge in uh, brain injury is differentiating mild from moderate uh, traumatic brain injury because the mild patients are those who can recover in time without uh, significant long-term uh, uh, effects. And, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least in the U.S. at uh, most clinical centers, uh, right now, people usually do a CT scan at the day of injury, and the CT scan is then followed by conventional MRI, which is a, uh, uh, usually a T1-weighted uh, um, 3D scan, uh, which is used to track longitudinal changes for at different follow-ups. And uh, the picture here shows uh, basically uh, a, a coronal cross section from a normal patient versus a coronal cross section from a moderate uh, traumatic brain injury patient. And we can all notice the geometric differences in the ventricular region and uh, probably some in the hippocampal region. But uh, basically, when we look at uh, an image of a mild traumatic brain injury patient, the MR scan looks pretty much uh, similar to a normal patient. Uh, it's, uh, visually, it's really difficult to, to just by looking at a, a T1-weighted scan to determine any, any abnormalities uh, in mild patients. And emergent imaging modalities like DTI and spectroscopy uh, uh, have shown promise and there, there, there are many papers basically indicating that uh, there is an advantage of using these techniques. But uh, even today, in the US at least, uh, these techniques are used in leading clinical centers with uh, dedicated teams basically doing the analysis and uh, uh, doing the image analysis and uh, processing. Uh, we, uh, we wanted to uh, come up with something that can address the mainstream clinical application of uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, that's why we uh, developed a shape and strain deformable brain model. Basically, this is a, this is a, a a deformable, a deformable uh, surface which uh, contains a, a whole set of uh, uh, subcortical structures. And uh, the model was uh, developed initially by uh, using uh, ground truth data. Uh, and the ground truth data is, uh, consists of ma manual tracings of uh, MR volumes. And uh, that information along with the, uh, uh, the, the tracings, along with the original data, was used to, to create uh, the shape-constraint model. Uh, the shape-constraint model uh, automatically adapts to uh, a given patient scan. And uh, there are a number of steps in the image processing chain. Uh, that starts with uh, rough shape location and then uh, a, a couple of additional steps of uh, more fine shape adaptation until the, 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 patient, the new patient scan is uh, completely segmented. And uh, the, these are a uh, few cross sections showing how the uh, how a final segmentation results of the uh, brain model looks like in, in a new patient. And so I should mention here that this is a fully automatic technique. Uh, it, it doesn't involve any manual user interaction. It's, uh, 
basically a single button push technique and so you only have to click adapt and uh, the model will fully automatically adapts to a new patient and uh, right now uh, this is still a research tool and it takes about 20 seconds to do the fu fully automatic segmentation. Uh, we did uh, uh, quantitative analysis of the tool because this is another issue that uh, we consistently see over and over again when it comes to quantification of, uh, of uh, neuroscans. I mean, uh, even uh, this, is, this is actually valid uh, in, in case of uh, DTI scans as well. Re reproducibility of analysis and accuracy are really important when it comes to, uh, to uh, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, quantification. So we did uh, quantitative analysis of the accuracy, and uh, these are results that show uh, basically the, 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 the average mesh distance and the average volume difference and the, 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 the dice coefficient. And we can calculate this because we have ground truth data from manual tracers. The, that ground truth data defines surfaces. And so we can use the model uh, uh, basically to adapt it to the to, uh, patient scan with uh, predefined ground truth and calculate quantitative measure of the accuracy of the segmentation. And th these are just different uh, types of uh, uh, metrics that we use. Uh, earlier this year at uh, Lehi Clinic in Burlington, which is right outside of Boston, we did a quantitative analysis of the brain model versus FSL and FreeSurfer. And uh, FSL and FreeSurfer, uh, if you haven't used them, those are tools which are uh, freely available to the academic research community. And they do something similar, except the main difference here is uh, 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 in, in the in the workflow, and there is also uh, we also uh, managed to detect a, a significant difference in terms of accuracy and reproducibility. Uh, basically, uh, for these results here, we, we took uh, 10 healthy control patients. They were actually residents at the Lehi Clinic, uh, neuroradiology residents, and we scanned them twice within a week. And uh, uh, we calculated the absolute volume difference for uh, different subcortical structures. And because the, those are healthy, control pa uh, healthy patients, uh, we could assume that difference in relative volume uh, could be attributed to segmentation, uh, segmentation inaccuracy or uh, 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 variability, basically. Uh, we could uh, estimate uh, uh, we could estimate the scan risk scan uh, quantitative uh, matrix showing the reproducibility of segmentation and uh, these are the these are the charts that, that you see here basically the model based segmentation stands for the shape constraint deformable of brain model uh, this is the variability of uh, this is in a percent of uh, volume and uh, the model based segmentation, free surfer, and FSL. And uh, this is with the standard deviations, basically. And we saw that the shape constraint brain model is really comparable to free surfer, except that it uh, generates uh, uh, smaller standard deviations consistently. And uh, FSL, the subcortical segmentation of FSL, is uh, far off from uh, free surfer and the brain model. And, uh, then we, uh, we did a, a, a clinical study. We applied the brain model to segment uh, two groups of uh, patients, a group of uh, 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 healthy controls and a group of mild traumatic brain injury patients. Uh, we, the patients were imaged at two different time points and uh, their volumes were segmented with the brain model. And the volumetric uh, results were examined for significant differences with uh, multivariate analysis of covariance. And uh, this is uh, uh, basically uh, characteristics of the two groups. Uh, uh, the, the mild traumatic brain injury patients were with uh, Glasgow, Glasgow Coma Scale results from 13 to 15. And uh, uh, here you can see that uh, the two groups uh, don't differ significantly in, uh, in terms of uh, age, uh, gender, or uh, scan, uh, scan interval. Uh, this, uh, this chart basically shows the, the imaging, uh, the, 
uh, imaging time points of the mild brain injury group. Uh, the first time point was roughly about a month after injury on average, and the second time point was uh, about a year after injury. Uh, uh, here I should mention that uh, this was a, re a relatively mild traumatic brain injury uh, group. Uh, 13 of the 44 um, brain injury patients didn't have, uh, 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 didn't have any loss of consciousness at all. With the loss of consciousness, uh, the average loss of consciousness uh, uh, was equal to about two minutes. And, uh, uh, these are the these are how the uh, the volumetric results looked like at uh, the first time point, which was approximately the patients were imaged approximately a month after injury. There were significant different bilateral significant differences in the coded putamen and thalamus, and. Uh, uh, the second time point, uh, uh, we had significant differences also detected in the amygdala and the hippocampus, and. Uh, Although there were significant differences in the uh, in two additional structures, the amygdala and the hippocampus, the the, the level of the differences, uh, uh, the the differences between the mean was smaller in the second at uh, the second time point, which uh, uh, suggests some some type of uh, normalization over time. And uh, th these are the differences, uh, these are the significant differences that were detected uh, uh, in the traumatic brain injury, uh, traumatic brain injury group uh, at time point one versus time point two. And uh, I also examined the uh, control groups at time point one versus time point two without, uh, and I wasn't able to detect any, any significant differences. So this shows that uh, there are some, some effect of injury that uh, continue after the first month until the, the, the first year. And, uh, and this is actually how these differences look like in, in, in the affected regions. Here on the screen, you see uh, 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 two, mesh, two overlaid meshes from the putamen and thalamus. And uh, the green is uh, uh, an average mesh of all control patients, and uh, the red mesh is uh, registered, uh, a registered uh, mesh of the same region uh, from a traumatic brain injury patient and overlaid with the green. And uh, basically here these parts uh, show the, the, the structural atrophy that, uh, the, that uh, we start to see in the traumatic brain injury patients. The conclusions of these studies were that uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, mild traumatic brain injury, uh, is associated with small but uh, really detectable difference, uh, uh, really detectable structural atrophy in subcortical regions even uh, at uh, one month after injury. Uh, the differences persist uh, about a year uh, after injury, but uh, uh, they. Uh, uh, their degree tends to normalize over time, uh, which suggests for some, some kind of normalization. And uh, the model-based segmentation that we developed was, uh, was able to uh, detect these differences. And uh, we're actually uh, uh, planning to use the model-based segmentation uh, in a future study with uh, Dr. Vanier actually to, uh, to uh, uh, Combine that with our commercially available fiber track package for uh, diffusion tensor imaging and uh, try to increase the uh, reproducibility and uh, reliability of the DTI analysis. And uh, before I take any questions, I need to, I want to thank the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center for uh, 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 providing the uh, patients uh, for, for the. TBI study, the Ter School of Engineering at Dartmouth, and um, the Lehi Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts. Thanks.